This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So welcome to this uh, week's edition of the uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. Uh, I wanted to uh, go over something that I've mentioned before. Um, these days, I often find myself repeating myself uh, without knowing it. This time, I do know it. Uh, and I'm going to go back to uh, uh, some passages in the Grundrisse, which uh, were very important for me, and I think we want to need, I need to go over them a bit uh, more carefully. Uh, and uh, so here we, here we go. Uh, so in the Grundrisse, Marx points out that uh, individuals are now ruled by abstractions. Uh, by that he means that things like the interest rate, the profit rate, all those kinds of things are abstractions and that we find ourselves employed or unemployed because they are moving in this direction or that direction. Uh, so we're now ruled by abstractions, whereas earlier individuals depended upon one another. And he then goes on to observe, the abstraction or idea, however, is nothing more than the theoretical expression of those material relations which are their lord and master. Now, this is a, an idea which uh, is important to Marx, and I think we should spend a little time getting it right. Basically, what Marx is saying is that ideas don't originate out of the sky. They don't, they're not given by God. They're not given in that, in that kind of way. They arise out of experience. And through our experience, we start to actually formulate certain concepts and ideas which reflect that experience. Now, it's not a perfect reflection. Marx doesn't make that claim. It's not a deterministic relation between the material experience and the ideas. But the ideas themselves are grounded, as it were, in human experience. And that is, therefore, a very important proposition. So the question arises, what kind of experience is dominant? which grounds ideas. Now, Marx's example of this in the Grundrisse is to say that we're familiar with uh, bourgeois notions of constitutionality. We're familiar with, uh, for instance, the slogan of the French Revolution about liberté, égalité, fraternité. And Marx says, actually, slogans of that sort and ideas about liberty, equality, and reciprocity, ideas of that sort, uh, actually arise out of a kind of society where there's a great deal of market exchange going on between independent producers. The kind of imaginary you'd have here is of a society in which there's a great deal of production, which is artisan production, and the artisans will be making bread, and some will be making shoes, and some will be you know, making shirts, and some people will be you know, making implements and so on. And they all trade with each other in some way, and uh, they have a market system. Uh, and this would require that there be equality, uh, freedom of exchange, and also reciprocity in the sense that we all recognize that in order for society to, to work, we all are dependent, interdependent with one another. And that is the foundation of bourgeois constitutionality. And, and so Marx then points out that the bourgeois constitutions, which are drawn from that 18th century world, that those constitutions were drawn from that world of experience, but that they are not drawn from factory labor and from the experience of the factory system as Marx encountered it in the mid-19th century. The Manchester factories, uh, the, the, the Detroit auto factories, and so on. So Marx is sort of saying, all right, there is an experiential basis to bourgeois constitutionality, and we know exactly what it is. But he then goes on to say this. Relations can be expressed, of course, only in ideas. And thus, philosophers have determined the reign of ideas to be the peculiarity of the new age, and have identified the creation of free individuality with the ideological overthrow of this reign, that is, the feudal reign of feudal relations. So ideas then are part of the representation of the experience, and the ideas themselves uh, start to take on a life of their own. But he then goes on saying, this error, which is to see 
as if free individuality was an ideological overthrow. The, the error was all the more easily committed from the ideological standpoint, as this reign appears with the consciousness of individuals as the reign of ideas, and because the belief in the permanence of these ideas is, of course, consolidated, nourished, and inculcated by the ruling classes by all means available. So the picture that Marx is setting up here, I think this is a, you know, a, a, an interesting way to think of it, is to say, well, these ideas about bourgeois constitutionality arose out of experience of, of market exchange and a certain market exchange society. They then became consolidated so that people started to think that the ideas were somehow or other a material force around them. And so to the degree that they became inculcated in these ideas, they then became sort of uh, 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 caught up in uh, the nature of these ideas and become... Uh, if you like, victim of the abstractions involved in these ideas. So this is what Marx is really trying to, trying to say here. Now, he then goes on to say it's not only experience, but also the perpetuation of the ideas is very much about what the ruling class tries to do. And so the ruling classes then come into it. So the ruling classes then latch on to this idea that uh, the ideas don't emanate from them, do not emanate from experience, but are simply created by human uh, imaginary imag endeavor. Now, it was a wonderful moment when we, we saw this, when uh, George Bush Jr. was giving an address to the British Parliament, and he was talking about the realm of freedom, which he was trying to bring to Iraq through the invasion of Iraq, and he kind of said, you know, my error is that I'm too far committed to the ideas of uh, free freedom and, and liberty, and I am therefore about delivering freedom and liberty to the rest of the world. Uh, and then, then he said, or his speechwriter said, uh, the error probably comes from reading too much John Locke. And you kind of go, well, the thought of George Bush Jr. reading John Locke is a bit, <laughs> a bit wild, but nevertheless, his speechwriter was trying to say very much about it's in the realm, it all operated in the realm of ideas. And it is the realm of ideas about individuality and freedom and liberty and reciprocity and all of that, which becomes incorporated in bourgeois constitutionality. And those ideas operate in society with a certain material form. Now, the interesting thing here is these ideas arose out of that kind of market society. They did not arise out of the factory system of the sort that Marx was studying in Manchester in the mid-19th century, or that we now know exists in Bangladesh and China and all the rest of it. What kinds of ideas would arise out of those experiences? That is the kind of question. And why is it that the ruling classes don't want us to think about the ideas that arise right out of that, which, of course, is, are the ideas of Marx? They want us to keep on thinking about John Locke and, and, and the bourgeois virtue and all the rest of it, because it masks, if you like, what the bourgeoisie is up to, what the ruling class is up to, and it masks uh, concern for how the experiences that people are having them are so radically different from those which are expressed in bourgeois constitutionality, so that the American Constitution regulates exchange between capitalists, but it doesn't help at all with the exchange between capital and labor. And that is where Marx wants to go. He says, well, what kind of world is created with capital and labor? So this then brings us to, to, to a sort of interesting question. How are the ruling ideas constructed of the ruling class? And what role does that construction of the ruling ideas of the ruling class play in politics today? I'm frequently asked these, in these days, is neoliberalism over? Now, this is an interesting kind of question, particularly since it's largely posed around this idea that neoliberalism is a set of ruling ideas. And ruling ideas that, that came to be somewhere or other around the 1970s. And people go back and actually reconstruct the history of those ideas. And of course, they get back in the 1920s and they get back in the 1860s and they soon find. The neoliberal ideas have been around for a very, very long time. But there were ideas which were locked, as it were, into 
uh, the, the, the few, what a few economists would think about and how they would think about it. And these ideas, uh, uh, ruling ideas, uh, were, were, were not, uh, put it this way, neoliberal ideas were not ruling ideas until the 1970s. And this has a, 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 an interesting uh, background. Uh, before the 1970s, economists were rarely consulted. Economists sort of were trying to understand the economy and try to figure out what was going on. But if you look at where, where most politicians were coming from and most planners and that were coming from, they, they, they were educated in history. They were educated in politics. They were educated in law. But by and large, economists were not the ruling experts in the 1960s. Yes, May, Maynard Keynes was an ex, one of the experts who was listened to a lot. But the interesting thing about Keynes was he was not a pure economist by any standard. The general theory that Keynes wrote was about one third technical economics and two thirds was about psychology and anticipations and expectations and all the rest of it. So Keynes was also a person who was embedded in London in something called the Bloomsbury sect which include Virginia Woolf and all of those kinds of people. And he was, he was about Western society and West, Western civilization and all the rest of it. So his economics was embedded, as it were, in a kind of more broader kind of sense of, 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 of what would a good society look like. And he was very critical of, of, of many aspects of, uh, of a capitalist society. For instance, he, he, he considered uh, the, the, the quest for money as somehow or other uh, unhealthy. He actually kind of said those who dedicate their life to making money uh, should be uh, sent to a mental institution to, for, 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 for examination because uh, so he, he, was, he was a very, very different kind of person. So he was a, a, a politician and, 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 and the like, but he was not an, he never he presented himself purely as uh, a, an economist. So economists were, were not very popular in the 1950s and 1960s. In the 1970s, however, there was a crisis. There was a crisis for the ruling class. And the crisis of the ruling class was that their wealth was seriously threatened. And in that point, they started to think about uh, an alternative. And they started to think about an alternative which had at its base and at its core the disempowerment of labor. But as far as capitalism was concerned in the 1970s, the, the core problem for them, not for the whole of society, the core problem for them was that labor was getting too powerful and labor was making too, much demand, too many demands and was actually being able to press home those demands. And labor was actually very powerful, for instance, in the United States with the Democratic Party and became, through the Democratic Party, we had things like, uh, you know, occupational safety and health legislation. We had environmental protection legislation, consumer legislation, a raft of anti-corporate le legislation. Uh, so the ruling class kind of said, enough is enough. And we have to find some way to go against this. And we have to disempower labor. So their mission was to disempower labor, to disempower the ruling ideas by which labor could start to organize uh, social democratically in Europe and also through the Democratic Party in the United States. So the mission then of the capitalist class at that time was to find a way, but it needed to have ruling ideas to be able to do it. And it was at that point that the ruling class turned to the neoliberal thinkers and said, Give us the ruling ideas. And the neoliberal thinkers were important because they were thinking about supply conditions, not demand conditions. Basically, in the Keynesian era and the, the 1950s, mainly the policy was oriented towards you know, managing demand, and then the society would be stabilized by having a good managed demand strategy. In the 1970s, the bourgeoisie turned to a theory that kind of said, no, the important thing is supply side economics. And the big supply side issue is the cost of labor, the vitality of labor, the abilities of labor to actually command uh, markets, to be able to go on strike and all the rest of it. So in the 1970s, you have something interesting. You have a political movement by the ruling class. And the ruling class, in effect, went on investment strike. 
they refused to invest. And as they refused to invest, they created unemployment. And as they created unemployment, so labor began to be disempowered. The other thing they did was they started to globalize. And by globalizing, they started to, to find ways to find a labor supply that was much cheaper. And so they made, increasingly made labor in the United States having to compete with labor in Mexico and in the end in China and all the rest of it. So that was the, the second strategy. The third strategy was through technological change. That is, technological change was mobilized to be labor saving. And so to, to the degree that technological change did become labor saving, so it disempowered labor. And so in 1980, 1981, 1982, there was a serious recession in the United States. Major unemployment went up to 10%. A political attack against the, the union movement and so on then followed. But the ruling ideas had to change. And now the, the, the idea is uh, spread around and says, well, it was simply a change of ideas that mattered. Philosophers came along and said, oh, it was a change of ideas. And the great thing about this is that was wonderful from the standpoint of the ruling class, because the ruling class could say, we had nothing to do with it. It was just a change of ideas. And it had nothing to do with the changing experience that came out of engineered unemployment and capital strike. No, that experience was not our doing. So in effect, in effect the, the, the ruling class could claim that somehow or other it, it had nothing to do with what happened with neoliberalism. And we have many theories of neoliberalism now, which actually talk about it as something which was produced in the realm of ideas. Now, my argument was it was not produced in the realm of ideas. I go back to the Marxist proposition. It came out of certain experiences which were engineered in the 1970s by the capitalist class. And it came out because the ruling class at the time decided that it was very fortuitous that there were these, rule, these ideas around that could become the ruling ideas, which were the ideas of neoliberalism. Now, if that interpretation is correct, when somebody says to me now, is neoliberalism over? My answer would be, well, actually, the ruling ideas never worked that well. I, those who pe the person who tried to implement the ruling ideas in, in, in their purity was Margaret Thatcher. And she was entering into major, major crisis situation in British politics because of that. The only reason she got re-elected was because she went to war in the Falkland Islands against Argentina and therefore everybody in Britain could start to be jingoistic and say, well, rule Britannia, rule Britannia and all of that. So she got behind all of that. But the ruling ideas were, were not working. They did not work in Chile where they were first employed in, in 1975 under Pinochet. They didn't work. So actually, the, the ideas themselves were an ideological scam, if you like, placed upon what was really happening beneath. And what was really happening underneath was the gradual development of recapturing value from workers and from the working class by capital. And that capital could use the ruling ideas and the policies attached to the ruling ideas as a means to try to reestablish its wealth and its power. And it did that systematically through the 1980s and 1990s, and it has done so dramatically over the last few years. So when somebody says to me, neoliberalism is over, my answer to them is, well, does that mean the concentration and the centralization of wealth and power within the ruling class has diminished in any way? And the answer is no, it has not diminished in any way. It has actually expanded, expanded dramatically in the last few years. And here is an example, uh, the example I would give. Just a couple of weeks ago, an article appeared in the Financial Times about the billionaire boom. Now, this is something which is, again, useful to think of. When we say we have a big, big problem with class analysis, I don't have a problem with understanding who the capitalist class is. And let's, for, just for proxy, say it's the billionaire class, and let's see what's been happening to the billionaire class. This is a very careful a result, a very careful analysis of what's been happening around the world everywhere. And here we go. Over the past two de decades, as the global population of billionaires rose more than fivefold, 
and the largest fortunes rocketed past 100 billion. Okay, so fivefold in the last five years. The pandemic has reinforced this trend. And here is what I'm quoting from the Financial Times, respectable source, right? As the virus spread, central banks injected 9 trillion into economies worldwide. 9 trillion. Aiming to keep the world economy afloat. Much of that stimulus has gone into financial markets and from there into the net worth of the ultra rich. The total wealth of billionaires worldwide rose by 5 trillion to 13 trillion dollars in 12 months. This is the most dramatic surge ever registered. The billionaire population numbers have boomed. They rose nearly 700 to a record total of more than 2,700. So let's say, if we want to know who the capitalist class is right now, the first cut would be to say the 2,700 billionaires. Here's the interesting thing. The biggest surge came in China, which added 238 billionaires into one every 36 hours for a total of 626. Next came the United States, which added 110 billionaires for a total of 724. The top 10 gainers in the US and China each saw already vast fortunes grow in just one year by sums that not long ago would have seemed impossible in a lifetime. And the citation here is Elon Musk. I often wonder what this guy does. But his net worth went from 25 billion to more than 150 billion in one year. That's what happened during the pandemic. Now, what the writer does is then say this is not unusual in the United States. In India, for example, a relatively poor country, billionaire wealth has soared to the equivalent of more than 17% of gross domestic product, one of the highest shares in the world, with most of the gains accruing to a narrow set of families in industries prone to crony capitalism. A bit further on, America's billionaires class uh, has increased in the following way. In 2010, they had 10% of the gross domestic product. In 2015, so this was on well, well going on, they had, that had risen from 10% to 15%. In 2020, in the course of the pandemic, it had gone to 20%. That is, the share of the US billionaire class in national wealth had doubled between 2010 and 2020. So when you, and, and as a result, we have the following situation that the bottom half of the U.S. population had less wealth than the top three U.S. billionaires, that is, Gates, Buffett, Bezos. This inequality. So if, if neoliberalism is about the concentration and centralization of wealth and power within a billionaire class, and if you ask me, is it over? The answer is no, they're still at it. It's just that the legitimation they got from the ideas of neoliberalism way back in the 1970s is no longer there. Yes, they still try to use it, but they've given up even bothering to use it because they're actually piling on and on and on hugely. Now, here's a number of questions which immediately get raised. How is this concentration of wealth occurring? Where is it occurring? And what are these people doing? And what are the consequences of this huge concentration of wealth within the billionaire class, particularly in a country like China? Now, I suspect, so just take the China case for a minute. I suspect that the Communist Party in China has been blindsided by this sudden surge, huge surge, in billionaire wealth in China. I mean, it threatens to become an oligarchy. 
Now, there was already a joke when I was there four or five years ago. There was this joke circulating, which kind of said, you know, people like to talk about state-owned enterprises, when what we really have is an enterprise-owned state. So there was already that joke uh, circulating around. But how can the Communist Party retain its power in the face of that huge increase in the number of billionaires, one every 36 hours during the pandemic? How can, how can that power be struck? And what we see going on, a number of things on this, this explains something that's happening on the, right now in China, if you read the financial press. First off, there's a clampdown going on some of the major players. Uh, Jack Ma, who was in Alibaba, one of the key figures in all of this, started to say a few things about how everything should work. Jack Ma, Ma sort of disappeared. He's reappeared a little bit, and now he's disappeared again. Uh, Alibaba has been, been chased by the Communist Party. There's a great deal of disciplining going on. Most of those large firms started to try to raise capital on the U.S. capital market. So they started going to Wall Street to try to set up uh, 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 these uh, you know, IPOs. Uh, uh, offerings on, 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 on Wall Street. Suddenly, China has stepped in and stopped them. So they've all been stopped. So they now, if they want to raise money, they can't do it in Wall Street anymore. They have to do it via Hong Kong, which, of course, China is increasingly controlling, or through Shanghai. So there's, 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 there's a great tension going on. The other thing that's happening is this. The parallel with the greater concentration of wealth in this oligarchy, there has been a centralization and concentration of power within the Communist Party. Xi has centralized a great deal of power. And in a sense, you can understand why. Because the only way in which you could really start to maintain the power of the Communist Party in the face of this huge concentration of wealth and power within the oligarchy the only way you could do that is to confront them with strong, centralized political power. And this is, in effect, what Xi is doing. Now, Russia is, a, is another example. The oligarchy in Russia and Putin. Now, Putin, for a while, started to really have to discipline the oligarchy. And it disciplined them, he did, by putting a couple of them behind bars and the others are now disciplined and they do whatever Putin wants and whatever Putin asks. That is, they can, they can develop their wealth and power. Uh, but they have to contribute to the, 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 the Russian economy and presumably also uh, to Putin's personal wealth in, in, in very significant ways. So in a sense, Russia is a very good example of an oligarchy arising and an oligarchy stabilizing around strong centralized political power, which if they get out of control, they're likely to find themselves behind bars. And we're seeing the same thing going on in China. But in, for order, in order for that to happen means that you have to have a strong centralized authoritarian state apparatus that is capable of disciplining these people. And in both China and the United States right now, what you see is the neoliberal kind of concentration of wealth and power in a billionaire class and an oligarchy is becoming very problematic in society in general, and therefore there has to be a very strong political center. So there's a contest going on there, and therefore we should be watching that very carefully for what it's, uh, what it's doing. And the ability of Chinese capitalists to raise money outside of China is being curbed, and, and now China is kind of really leaning on that 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 uh, uh, oligarchy to do to do the right do the right thing by China. So there's a very interesting kind of thing as to whether China will indeed become uh, a, a sort of a, a, a centralized political power with the oligarchy under wraps, or whether the oligarchy will have the power. Now the problem here is that. There are certain people within the Communist Party who are also extremely wealthy. Some of those billionaires we're looking at are actually party members. And so this is, this is where the dilemma lies in China. In the United States, we have this situation then, in which the immense concentration of wealth and power 
in the uh, in, in this oligarch is is seriously problematic and the big question is what are they what are they doing politically and why is it that we are not actually getting you know, so angry about it that we do something about it now to be sure Bernie Sanders says things and Elizabeth Warren wants to have a wealth tax and all the rest of it so yes there is some statement about this but what does the media do how does the media respond to all of this the media is kind of essentially ignoring it I mean, if every night there was another kind of thing about the, you know, this class and what it was doing and, 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 and what kinds of struggles were developing around it, we would, be, we would be starting to think about ourselves in a very, very different way. But what, of course, the media is occupied by is you know, Donald Trump's escapades. Now, let's try to understand something here. The reason that Donald Trump is so popular with the oligarchy, with this billionaire class, and the reason they continue to fund his stupidities is that he takes away attention. So every night the media is on another thing about Donald Trump this and Donald Trump that, and will he get indicted or won't he get indicted? Uh, it, it's a great mask. So nobody asks about how did Musk go and get all that money. And where did it come from? And what is he doing with it? Nobody's actually concerned with this. Insofar as the media is concerned with it, it is simply concerned whether there are good billionaires or bad billionaires. The good billionaires are obviously people like Gates and Buffett, Soros maybe, even Bloomberg. Gates and Buffett and maybe Bloomberg, and, you know, George Soros more problematically. But then there are the bad billionaires, uh, and we get a little bit of coverage of that, but not much. Consider, for example, the Sacklers with Purdue Pharma, now, and with OxyContin. Now, 500,000 people have died from OxyContin deaths. Now, that's not quite as many as have died from the virus, but it's getting pretty close, right? I mean, 650,000 people died with the virus, 500,000 with OxyContin. OxyContin deaths were over a seven-year period. The virus is concentrated in one, one year. Everybody is going to town about controlling the virus and, oh, yeah, you're vaccinating the virus and so on. But what has been going on with the OxyContin? Finally, something has been giving, and yes, indeed, it starts to be recognized that this was something that the big farmer actually manufactured. It manufactured it for profitability purposes, and it was a painkiller, which was addictive, and they knew it was addictive, and addicted populations consumed vast amounts of it. So the big farmer became very, very, very rich uh, on this. The Sackler family became one of the richest families in the country with Purdue Pharma. Johnson & Johnson, which has now recovered some of its reputation because it has a good vaccine for the, uh, for, the, for the virus, was also a producer of OxyContin. Just now, we have finally settled a suit against uh, Purdue and the Sackler family. And the, the deal is, that all of the people suing <clears throat> the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma will accept the proposal from Purdue Pharma to go bankrupt. And in going bankrupt, it's able to reconstitute itself free of any kind of things that went before. Uh, but it will pay $4.5 billion in compensation for the OxyContin deaths. At the same time, it will also release a great deal of information that this, they wanted to keep. Silent. And the family will pay a certain amount along with it. Now, so the, the, this is the, the example of the bad one, which becomes open to everybody. But again, we've not heard that much about it. If everybody had been following the OxyContin case with the, with the detail that uh, we've been following Trump's antics, we'd be thinking about the world in a very different place. Furthermore. We have to think that it's, we're not only we're we dealing with Gates and that, we're also dealing with some of the others 
out there who are doing some pretty nasty things. There was this whole kind of case in North Carolina about uh, the appointment of Hannah Jones, some of the billion, a billionaire uh, endower of uh, North Carolina University. Uh, said, we don't want this stuff about critical race theory. And so she was denied tenure. Well, she was there then, there was a big fuss. And so in the end, they said they'd give her tenure by then. She told them basically, screw you. I'm off to Howard University where I can create what I want and bring along Tahiti Coates with me. So th these are the kinds of, imp uh, the, the kinds of uh, things which people do with their, with their wealth. Bloomberg, for example, creates the School of Public Health in, in, in uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University, which in some ways is a good thing. But on the other hand, try being a Marxist in the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. In other words, the billionaire class is very much about its philanthropy and tries to, at the same time, use its power politically. And a lot of the money that pours into Donald Trump comes from the billionaire class because he's protecting them from scrutiny by actually hogging the limelight, doing all kinds of crazy things. So I, for all I know, probably the billionaire class think he's a bit of a, a, an idiot, but he's a useful idiot, an extremely useful idiot. He does exactly what it is that they want. So here we have the ruling class right now, which is interfering in elections in major, major ways, and is interfering politically in major, major ways. Take, for example, the Koch brothers. Koch brothers, yeah, great philanthropists. Uh, they support Lincoln Center. They, you go to the Museum of Natural History, and what do you find? You find the Koch brothers uh, sponsoring the Dinosaur Hall. Uh, they, they're fantastic when it comes to, to medical research on cancer. Uh, so so the, all of these cancer ins institutes uh, funded by the Koch brothers. But what they will not, under any circumstances, tolerate is any inspection of their chemical business, which, of course, has a lot to do with the production of, of carcinogenic materials. In other, in other words, it's all about cure, not about prevention. That is what they're into. The same thing goes with somebody like Peter Langone. Made his money, billionaire, very, very rich. And... Uh, he's he's a big sponsor of uh, the NYU University. So right across where I am right now, there is the Langone School of Neurological Research. I ended up there myself early on for treatment, and they have a ferry bringing people in. So this is the, this is what Langone does with his money. But Langone played a very important role in the downfall of the governor of New York State, uh, Elliot Spitzer. Elliot Spitzer had been a, a, a lawyer uh, in the DA's office who had been going after malfeasance on Wall Street. Wall Street hated him, and they wanted to get the dirt on him if they possibly could. And Langone was one of the people who was leading the charge in terms of getting hiring people uh, to watch uh, very carefully what Elliot Spitzer was up to and where he was going and what he was doing. And they discovered that every now and again, he was having trysts with uh, what we call uh, uh, high-end escorts, otherwise prostitutes. Uh, he, he was having occasional trysts, and he was very careful about the way he went about it, but they got him. So Langone played a very important role in the demise of Elliot Spitzer. They got the dirt on him, and he had to resign as... Uh, of, uh, as governor of New York, and he was got out of the way in terms of the, you know, attacking what was going on in Wall Street. So this is, this is the, how the capitalist class is constituted right now. And it's really, really interesting to think about what this really means. And I think one of the most wonderful things I saw was uh, uh, the son of Warren Buffett, Peter Buffett. Well, as Warren Buffett got older, he divided his fortune up and gave it to his kids. And his kid ended up with a huge kind of amount, and he had to sort of set up a foundation and decided to do good. And he's a musician, interested in music. And so he wasn't really into this world that Buffett was into. He wasn't into that at all, but found himself suddenly joining together with lots of other philanthropists in meetings about what the philanthropists must do. And he wrote a wonderful piece in the New York Times, and you should go read it if you possibly can in which he talked about 
you know, Peter Buffett talked about what it was to be in, in the philanthropy world. And he, he, was, he was shocked. And at a certain point, he kind of says towards the end of this thing, they were dictating things about what was going to go on in the world, how it was going to be done, and all the rest of it. That was what philanthropy was about. It was a, a sort of rather authoritarian sort of structure to, to, to how, uh, you know, welfare should be delivered. It was a privatization of welfare. But he pointed out that he, he sat in the room and he said, I suddenly realized that what, what I was looking at was people with their left hand were trying to clean up the mess they were making with their right hand. And that this was what was so where the wealth was coming from. So the one thing you cannot get from philanthropy is an institute of anti-capitalist struggles. That is, if I go to some big, big corporation or, or go to one of these big welfare donors and say, hey, give me some money, I want to really want to do some. Do you think they would fund an anti-capitalist struggle? No, the answer is not. So this is the ruling class as it's constituted. My main point then is that the ruling class is as dedicated as it's always been to the maintenance and sustenance of its power through increase of its power. And all of that data on what is happening and what happened during the pandemic is a classic example of the choice, political choice being made by the political class, that when given the option of rescuing people or rescuing the capitalist class, they rescued the capitalist class. And they rescued and sustained the capitalist class. So neoliberalism, if you interpret the way I interpret it, which is a, a power grab by the capitalist class, then that power grab is still on and we're still in the era of neoliberalism. Yeah, a lot of the excuses in terms of the ruling ideas uh, sound a bit crooked these days and a bit corny, but people don't bother with that anymore. They're simply about the raw exercise of ruling class power in ruling ways. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.